Our Bible reading for our service this morning is from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, reading verses 9 through to 13. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So let's pray. Lord God, as we come to your word, Lord God, we pray that we would be open to receive it, Lord, that we would have open ears to hear it, and Lord, we pray that our lives and our hearts would be such so that we would put down deep roots into your word. And Lord, allow it to grow, that it would produce much fruit for you and for your kingdom's sake. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we looked at the first three words of the Apostles' Creed, which say, I believe in and we looked in terms of that as Christians are primarily believers rather than just doers and actually the centrality of belief is such is that it is what we believe in that shapes what we do it shapes ourselves as a person it shapes what we do as a church but the phrase I believe in then moves us into the next phrase that we're going to look at today which is God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so to begin, Christians have always professed that a God is a God of three persons. God is always um, a triune God of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And so what we're going to look at today is the person of God the Father. Because God does not just have some fatherly attributes or have a father like character but there is a god the father within the godhead and so what i want to show this morning is that god as our father is both intensely personal and infinitely powerful now some of you might think well raymond that that's only two points out of the usual three does that mean that today's sermon is going to be shorter well i can make no promises about that but let's start with looking at the Bible and the passage that I read from Matthew chapter 6 and starting with how God is an intensely personal father. Because Jesus begins the Lord's Prayer with the words, Our Father. <clears throat> now, in the Middle East, it wouldn't be, have been unusual at that time for pagan people, such as the Romans, um, to claim that whatever God they had was their father. So for example, the, the, the Greeks with their pantheon, their multitude and plethora of gods that they worshipped, um, Zeus was the head honcho. And so the, the, the Romans would have very often said that Zeus was their father. But when Jesus spoke about the word father, it was in a completely different way. Because actually gods of other religions were not people you mess with you didn't want to mess with their gods they were very often seen as capricious or as fickle you know humans are very much the playthings of the gods something just there to amuse them and so people had to kept uh, sacrificing and as ways as appeasing and pleasing the gods because if you ever got anywhere on their bad side you were generally in for it which is why zeus is very often depicted with with with, with a lightning bolt in his hands as if to say if you got him hungry then zap you were going to get us. But when Jesus, on the other hand, talks about God, he says, Abba, Father. There's a new tenderness brought in because the word Jesus uses is the personal name for a father. In other words, Jesus says that when you call God Father, you actually address him as Dad. Which is again another difference between Christianity and other religions because it was only the Christian God who was the only Father who instead of not caring about his people, actually loved his people. He was bound up with his people and he sought their good 
rather than just things that were there for his amusement. And so this God is personal. And yet if this prayer was just our Father in the living room, then this prayer would lose its power. Because God as Father is not just intensely personal, but infinitely powerful. We're told our Father in heaven. You know, the location of God is transcendent. If you're old enough, you may remember, I'm not going to ask anyone's uh, age, but if you're old enough, you may remember when the first astronaut went into space. It, It was a Russian by the name of Yuri Gagarin. And when he made it up into space, um, he's famous or infamously um, recorded as saying, I made it into heaven and God is not there. And of course not, because orbit isn't heaven. And while God is everywhere at once, there is also a special location in heaven where God reigns and rules from outside the bounds of time and space. And so God is intensely personal as our dad and yet is infinitely powerful as he reigns and rules over the cosmos of his realm. There is nothing that he cannot do. But then it continues, our father in heaven to hallowed be your name. You know, throughout the Bible, the name of our God is hallowed. And the word for hallowed basically just means to revere, that there's a weight to the name. But there's kind of a fear at the mention of this name that is a good kind of fear. Let me put it to you this way, that generally speaking, at at least for me, the bigger the animal, the more fear you will have. And so, for example, if I was to knock on someone's door and they answered with a chihuahua by the name of Crusher. And, And as you walk in, you know, Crusher is just losing his mind. Now, I'm not exactly a, a big dude, um, and neither in terms of height nor width. Um, you know, I, I'm just over five, six in height, and a chihuahua is about five inches. And so I'm not going to be scared, you know, e- e- even if it's barking, even if it's got small dog syndrome, you know, it's probably bark just to make sure, oh, you know, you know uh, as if to say, just don't step on me. Um, you know, because even if the dog was to come at you, you know, all you'd really need to do is kind of swing your leg and it's goodbye hamster dog. But if I knock on someone's door and, and you know, someone answers with the German shepherd called Blitz, it's, it's really going to be a bit of a different story. And it's not that I'm any different. I'm still the same size, but the dog is bigger. The dog is weightier. It puts a bit more fear in me. It evokes a bit more awe from me. And so if that is true at an animal level, how much truer at the infinite level of God the Father? Hallowed be his name. Which is why in the Old Testament we're told not to take the name of the Lord your God in vain, which is a command that is so much bigger than just bad language. It's not just using the name of God as a curse word and so on. It's so much more than that. It's a command not to take the name of God or the things of God flippantly or to take them lightly, rather hallowed be his name. And then the next line of the prayer is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus teaches his disciples in this prayer that they should be praying and they should be asking for earth to become like heaven. He's saying our prayer life shouldn't just um, devolve into kind of a a list of things like our Amazon wish list as if say, God, here's the things I want. And if you get back to me with these as soon as you can, then that would be really appreciated. He's saying rather the things we should be seeking, the things that we should be asking for is for God's kingdom to become more and more manifested, to become more and more visible and established here on the earth. Because that's one of the things that Jesus came to do in his first coming, at the first Christmas, in a stable, in a manger in Bethlehem. What Jesus was doing is that he was inaugurating the coming of God's kingdom. Which is is to say that when Jesus first came, he began the work. 
of establishing God's kingdom here on earth. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes again at the end, he will come and he will return to consummate that kingdom. He will return to bring to completion the full establishment of God's kingdom, of God's rule and his reign here on earth. And what we will see when that happens is when the kingdom is consummated, when it's complete, when the kingdom of God is fully established here on the earth, is that all that the very makeup of all that we've known will, have, will, will, will be so changed and transformed way for the better. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament says that when this happens, that the wolf and the lamb will lie down together. We're told that in Isaiah chapter 11. You know, we're given this beautiful picture of peace where killing and where fighting no longer happens. It's a thing of the past. Again, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 35, he gives this picture of roses blooming in the desert. And I know there are some people who have really green thumbs. I've visited their houses. I've visited your houses. So I know some of you have fantastic gardens. With, with wonderful flowers, beautiful trees and plants and so on. But I, I challenge anyone listening to this to make roses bloom in a desert. That's a real challenge. And we'd very, find, and we'd very quickly find that it can't be done. Except that it can be done with God. Because that's the kind of infinite power that God has. The fact that he can make peace between natural enemies like a wolf and a lamb. And he can bring life and beauty to arid and barren places. Like making roses grow in the desert. But not only that, the Bible tells us that God, when he fully establishes kingdom, will kill death. Like who can do that? How infinitely powerful must you be to be able to tell that, yeah, you can't do that anymore. That's no longer happening. In fact, you, you're done here. You cannot get out. How infinitely powerful is God our Father that this is what his kingdom looks like as it's being rolled out. The death of death, the, the wolf and the lamb lying down together, that the creation that is groaning and longing where all of the brokenness of creation is righted by the consummation and the full establishment of his kingdom but then it goes from infinitely powerful but to intensely personal again because the next verse verse 11 says give us today our daily bread give us today our daily bread and what jesus is saying is that what god wants to give us is not just the things that we want but rather, since God is an, is an intensely personal father, instead of giving us what we want, he will give us what we need. And so I'm going to say something that, that may bother some of you, but I do want you to just hear me out on this. That it is only a selfish, unloving father that will always say yes. It's only a selfish, unloving father that will always say yes to whatever his children's desires are. Maybe to make up for some inadequacy that they feel or perhaps to make up for something that they've done. Because loving fathers don't always say yes to their children's desires. Because children's desires are immature and will ultimately harm them if we say yes to just absolutely everything. So there are times that the most loving thing a father can do is to go, nope, I'll be the killjoy here for your joy. I'll be the bad guy here for your good. I'll take all the scorn and the temper transoms and the, I can't believe you don't love me if you do this and this and so on, so that you can survive and can grow healthy. And if you're anywhere over the age of, of, of 21, and there's not many of uh, us in, in, in the room at the moment, I'm sure, um, but if you're anywhere uh, over the age of 21 all, you will already have examples in your own life where you can look back and say, thank you, father that you said no to that one what a mistake it would have been if that actually happened and we learn this more and more as we get older 
that our daily bread is not that God gives you everything you want, but it's that he gives you everything that you actually need. Because I have no doubt that all of you are brilliant. I have no doubt that some of you could be brilliant at business or you're brilliant at whatever your job is. Perhaps you're brilliant at caring for people. It might be that you're brilliant at DIY or it might be uh, something musical or, or indeed it could be gardening or baking or something else that you are just brilliant at. But whatever that is, you are not more brilliant and you are not smarter than God when it comes to knowing what is best for your life. You see, because when we come to God like that, it, it, it's the equivalent of a five or a six year old coming up to you and arguing that, you, that, that their way is better than yours. And it would be cute for sure, but it wouldn't be wise to actually follow us. Because you'd say, oh, that's cute. Now go and tidy your room all the same. Because you just know more than a five or six year old. And in fact, we see this example um, in a prayer that's in the book of Proverbs in chapter 30. Where the writer says from verse 7, Two things I ask of you, Lord. <clears throat> Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. But give me only my daily bread. There's that phrase again, and it makes me think that perhaps this is what Jesus had in mind when he mentioned it in the Lord's Prayer. But give me only my daily bread. And then it continues, otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, sure, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonour the name of my God. So again, what is that saying but give us today our daily bread where the writer of those verses and proverbs is saying lord give me only what i need because if i have more than what i need then my tendency will, will be to look at all my stuff and say i did this and i don't need god but at the same time father give me what i need because if you don't then i might steal and dishonor your name and i don't want to do anything that would dishonor your name But the next part stays personal as well. When in verse 12, Jesus says, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, some of us might have grown up in, uh, where instead of the word debts, we had the word trespasses. And others of us might have had the word sin or sins in there. But uh, the word that Jesus uses in, 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 in the original Greek actually combines both of these. And, and what Jesus is getting at is that he's saying that all sin, whether internal or external, whether they are sins of commission, where you do what you know is wrong, or sins of omission, where you don't do what you know is right. All of these sins, Jesus is saying, are first and foremost against God. We sin primarily against God. And yet, even when the sons of daughters of God sin against him, he still steps in with forgiveness. And the reason this is intensely personal is because there's nothing you can do that would make God the Father pull back from you. There's nothing where he goes, whoa, 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 I, I just need to take a step back here. Rather, and this is the thrust of next week's sermon, where instead of leaving us to, to just stew in our own mess, God comes to us and he continues to welcome us and to love us and to forgive us in Jesus which not only restores our relationship with him with the father but also restores our relationships with one another because it's intensely personal because this forgiveness that God offers affects our personal relationship with him whereby we are forgiven and we are healed and it's from knowing his forgiveness and knowing his healing in our lives that it's then our personal relationships with one another are affected. Because those I have sinned against and those who have sinned against me can be forgiven and those relationships can be healed. But it's then that the prayer ends 
with a coming back to show God as infinitely powerful. Where in verse 13 it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. One of the things the Bible is very clear about is that there is no sort of dualism going on. And what, and what I mean by that is that sometimes we can have a view of supernatural evil, such as the evil one or the devil or Satan or whatever name you want to give him, that is on par with the supernatural good, which is God in this case. And so we, 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 we see supernatural evil on one side and supernatural good on the other side. And when they do battle, it's like 50-50. It could go either way. Or if we pay too much attention to the tabloid newspapers or to the news we read in our TVs, um, or that we hear on TVs rather, um, it, it can appear that evil is getting so big, so large, so powerful, that it can appear totally unstoppable. Because that certainly seems to be what's going on in any kind of the scary movies that we watch. Where we might see that someone's been demon possessed. And straight away the first person called is the priest. And we know that as soon as they arrive, they're gone. Or they have no hope. You know, because they show up and they go in and they throw, splash a bit of uh, holy water about. And they say something like, the power of Christ compels you. And then, and then the person's head spins around and, and then the priest is toast. They are gone. And no one's surprised by that. But at the same time, that is not how it works in the Bible. There is no dualism. In fact, the picture that we're given in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, is that when the armies of evil and the armies of God take place in the battle that is called Armageddon, you can read about it in Revelation 16, but what actually happens? This big decisive battle between good and evil for it to be settled once and for all. What happens? Well, we're told all God does is show up and he speaks. He says, I am, and boom! You know, you know, this big climactic battle. The whole forces of evil gather there. They are to take on God and his armies. And all God has shown up and said, yeah, I'm here. And bang, the battle's over. It's settled in an instant. And so when we pray, deliver us from the evil one. What we are praying is to a Father God where what is formidable to us is an easy win for God. We can pray, deliver us from the evil one with confidence because that's how infinitely powerful our God is. And so God our Father is both infinitely powerful and intensely personal. It's not an either or, it is a both and. But in light of that, how then do we apply this to our lives? Well, I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks to how we think about God as father actually is to do with our own dads. And for some of you, it may be that your dad did such dark and unthinkable things that there is such a festering wound in your soul that you wrestle with. And the Lord will be generous to you, I believe, in that wrestle. But for most of us, we just had regular earthly fathers that did the best they could. But they're not God, so they've failed us in some way. But nonetheless, it doesn't mean that we can dump all of the issues of our lives on what our dads did. Rather, we probably should be more grateful and more generous to them. Because when I think of my own upbringing with uh, my own dad, you know, my dad's very much an old school kind of uh, man's man, which is that he never really displayed much emotion. And so the way I interacted with him was, is that you just did what he said and you left him alone. And it wasn't until later in life that I discovered that behind this man's man image, that my dad is actually very much a softy. But the problem is that when we, when we come to faith, we view our heavenly father through the lens of our earthly fathers, where we think, just do what he says and stay out of his way. And so it can be that we struggle with the idea of a father who so loves us and delights in us and rejoices over us 
because instead we get caught up in this I could do better than this and I better do this in order to be approved of kind of nonsense really. And so as part of the struggle that some of us may have is that if God as our Father really does love us, really does delight in us, really is intensely personal and yet is infinitely powerful that he can do anything, the other problems coming out of that is, well then that God ha has some explaining to do. Because there are certain events and certain seasons of our lives where I have questions for him, don't we? Because if God is infinitely powerful and intensely personal, then where was he when blank happened? Because in my own life, I have a brother that died before I was born. My mum was pregnant with me at the time. And his name was Samuel and he died in November 87 and I was born in February 88. And what happened was uh, it, it, it was a cough death or sudden infant death syndrome. And so he just stopped breathing one afternoon and, and that was it. And then on my 16th birthday, my grandmother had a stroke literally right in front of me and died in the early hours of the next morning. And in both instances, I don't have the answers as to why God, as intensely personal and as infinitely powerful as he is, allowed those things to happen. I, I, I don't have the answers for those. But the only way I know of how to deal with my own pain and my own struggles is to, is to think 10,000 years from now, how will I think about that? 10,000 years from now, how will I view that? Because my problem is my perspective. I don't know what God's up to. He's infinitely powerful. I can't comprehend what he can do. This side of eternity, I don't have all the answers. I only see through a glass darkly, or I only see the reflection of a mirror, the Bible tells us. But one day, while I, I, I only see in part, there will be a day that I will see and know in full. And so while I don't know everything that God's up to in his power, I can't comprehend it. But what I do know is that he's intensely personal. I do know that he's for me. I do know that he loves me. And so I want to end by asking you a question. Do you today believe that God is good? Do you believe that he's good? Not that you won't struggle with these things. Not that you won't wrestle with these things. We, 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 we all need to wrestle with them. But do you believe that he is good? And do you believe that God is for you and not against you, regardless of the circumstances? Because if you can settle that, then you can join with the refrain of Christians across 2,000 years of history who said, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for these men and women and for the opportunity just to sit under your word and to let it shape us. We thank you that you are a father that is good and gracious and kind. And maybe some of us today really need to know, really need to feel the love of the father. And so if you feel comfortable, I ask that you just open up your hands, just hold your hands out in a posture of openness. And we pray, Father, today you would give us our daily bread you would give to us what we need we pray father that you would come by our holy spirit do a deep work in our hearts today come and challenge any notions we have about how we see you that we would understand your inherent personal touch that you know us you love us you delight in us Although sometimes we feel there's no possibility that you could delight in us, and yet you do. Help us today to experience the love you have for us in our hearts. We pray, come Holy Spirit and fill our hearts with, a, with your love for us, with the knowledge of your love for us. 
we just pray, come, surround us, envelop us, overwhelm us. Because, Father, we rejoice ultimately in the fact that you are infinitely powerful and intensely personal. That you are for us and not against us. And so we pray that you would bless us. Pray, bless us, we pray. For we need you. In Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.